All right. So this morning's sermon, you know, the, the evenings we've been doing our Bible study through the uh, prophecy and going through Revelation, and we've been covering a lot of doctrine and kind of, you know, getting a little bit deeper in, in this, some of the aspects. This morning's sermon is not going to be a very deep sermon. It's not a very difficult concept to grasp, but it's probably going to be one of the hardest sermons to just actually make the changes in your life that are necessary. It's real simple, but um, difficult at the same time, it just seems to be. And this is something that we need to do. And it has to do with our attitude and our walk and our actions, which are always the most difficult. It's easy to learn doctrine, right? It's easy to have that, the, the willing heart to be able to receive and to understand and to learn what does the Bible say you know, it may, it may be hard to, to, to preach. It may be more interesting of a subject sometimes to, to follow along and get those cool nuggets of, of information and be like, wow, I never saw that before. And it's great to have that knowledge. But the Bible says that knowledge puffeth, puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And really, when you read throughout the Bible, it talks about charity being the end point, charity being the goal in your, your walk with God and your learning and your growth and everything else that charity is what you really need to have more than anything else. And I'm not going to preach all about charity. You can read 1 Corinthians 13, but I'm not just talking about giving money to the poor. You know, the modern idea of what charity is, you know, you have these charitable organizations that say, well, it's give, you know, you're giving money to, to help some, some cause or to help something else out. That's not really what charity is. The Bible says 1 Corinthians 13, though I give all my goods, you know, to, to feed the poor, he says, and I have not charity it profiteth me nothing. So it's possible to give all of your money away to an organization and you're not charitable at all. That's what the Bible says. Because the charity is what's inside. The charity is where your heart is. The charity is when you're caring about other people genuinely and, and you are doing something to help better someone else. That is what charity is. And this is what I think Christians, by and large, true believers need more of in our life is more charity, more caring, more willingness to go out and help other people and actually translate that into action, not just say, yeah, I believe that, but to actually do something about it. Look at verse number one here in Romans 4, because Romans 14 really covers a lot about our attitudes. Look at verse number one. It says, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. Now, the title of my sermon this morning is Support the Weak. And we'll go through many verses about that. There's a lot of people who are weak and in need and need those who have strength to help support them. And there's various ways that people can be weak. This is talking about someone who's weak in the faith. There's other people that may be weak physically. There's other people that may be you know, weak spirit. This is weak spiritually, you know, weak emotionally. Have other weaknesses that they need help with. So it starts off in verse number one here saying, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. You know, we may have people that come in and visit our church that they don't have a lot of good doctrinal foundation, knowledge, you know, the Bible. They may be mixed up on a lot of different areas. They may think different things are sins and this is right, you know, but they're saved. Okay, they're born again. They're weak in their faith, and, and they, 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 they have a lot of things maybe they're, they're not correct about. But he's saying, you know, him that's weak in the faith, receive that person. Don't just be like, well, no, go find some other church, buddy. You know, like receive them. And he says, but not to doubtful disputations, right? And, and, and this fightings over a lot of dumb things. We're going to see, you know, he goes in more in depth here. We'll read through this of what he's talking about. Verse number two, it says, for, he's going to explain that. What does he mean about the doubtful disputations? For one believeth that he may eat all things. Look at this. Another who is weak eateth herbs. So in the verse number two, it already defines who's the one that's correct and who's the one that's weak, right? Because it's saying, well, there's one person who believes that we may eat all things. Can we eat all things? Sure. Right? Now we know that we can't eat things offered, you know, and sacrifice to idols, whatever. But, but in general, I mean, the meats that we can eat, there's no dietary restrictions. And, you know, honestly, there's some people that have this mentality that they think that there's certain dietary restrictions that still apply to us today, that we should be found in us, that are believers. Right? 
or there's people who are believers that say, well, we shouldn't be eating animals. We should be vegetarians or whatever, okay? The Bible says here that that person is weak that just eateth herbs. That's what it's talking about here, someone who's just like a vegetarian. They're weak in their faith. They don't understand, but he's saying, look at verse number three, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So if someone has that belief, you know, don't despise that person. He's saying that's fine. No big deal. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Now, there's going to be a few more verses we're going to get through. We're going to go through this whole chapter. Talk about judging. And it's important that the very first time he's, he's bringing up this concept of judging, because what people will do with this is, is take it way too far to extreme of saying you can't judge anything ever and you know, this, this whole thing about, about not judging or saying anything that's wrong, you know, correcting people or anything like that. What we see here, it's the person who's weak at saying not to judge him that eateth. What does that mean? That means for that person to say, no, you're wrong and, and start judging the person who actually is right about being able to eat all things and judging him for eating meat or whatever. He's saying, look, that's not, um, first of all, it's not that big of a deal. It's uh, you know, a doubtful disputation, but, but don't be judging those that eat. It says, for God hath received him. Verse number four, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now, again, this is going kind of to the heart of the issue. There's some people that will need to receive some forms of correction sometimes, right? I mean, depending on where they're going, you might need to, to help steer someone on the right path or let someone know, hey, you know, by doing this, you're sinning. Now, if someone's a vegetarian, they're not sinning at all. They're not doing anyone any harm. They're not, they're not sinning against God. They're, they're a little mixed up in their belief, but they're not sinning. I mean, they're not, they're not just going off and getting into fornication or doing something like that where it would be appropriate to step in and be like, hey, you know, you, you really, you know, in, in, in humility and in brotherly love, explain to someone, you know, God's not happy with what you're doing. You, you know, you need to, you know, you, you ought to, to look at this and show them from Scripture. You know, that is appropriate. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you personally like to know if you're, if you're just in sin and doing something completely wrong? Of course you would. But at the same time, you know, there's certain areas, and we're going to see this here, when it comes to eating and stuff, that's not that big of a deal. We don't need to be getting in arguments and fights over stuff like this because who cares? These doubtful disputations is not going to do any edifying. It's just going to cause more strife than anything else. So he's saying, you know, what, why are you judging another man's servant anyways? You know, to his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Verse 5. Now he's going to talk about another example. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And again, this is something I would say, you know, some people today will, will still want to observe a Sabbath day. And say, well, we shouldn't do any, you know, we shouldn't be working. We should just kind of do a day of rest. And they want to esteem a certain day above another. You know what? Fine, go ahead and do that. I think the Bible is very clear that 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 has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. That the rest that we have, that's a you know, that picture of rest is was was uh, fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and He is our rest, and we enter into His rest. But you know what? I'm not going to get into some big, you know argument with just a regular, you know, just a church member. Now, as a pastor, I'm going to teach the Bible, but, but we're not going to, you know, just get into some arguments over people that come in, you know, and, and have this, and, you know, but they shouldn't be judging either. So, that, and that's the thing we're saying like, oh, well, you need to be doing this. Let's keep reading here because he says, uh, verse number six, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So this is talking about people who just want to serve the Lord, right? Whether they're eating or not eating, whether they're observing a day or not observing a day, he's saying, you know what, it's all for the Lord. So praise God to that. Let's, let's receive the people who are a little bit weaker, don't have the, like all the best doctrines necessary, receive them, and not just get into all these uh, you know, arguments and fights about this stuff. Verse number seven, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. 
For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's saying, you know what? At the end of it, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where we're going to receive the rewards and the things that we've done in this life. And, you know, God will sort that out right. on, on these, these little issues and just say, well, whatever. Yeah, you were wrong about that, but so what? Right? right? Because the judgment seat of Christ is where we receive for what we've done on this earth anyways. He's not going to be browbeating everyone for, for being wrong on certain doctrines. We don't see that at all the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is just, here's your works. They're all going to be accumulated. Here's everything you did in this world. And then it's going to be tried by fire. Anything you did that was of value that, that God deemed as, yeah, you know what? You had a lot of eternal value in the stuff that you did here. That's going to abide the fire. And you're going to get that reward then as a result. And everything else that he's like, well, you were real busy. You did a lot of stuff, but you really didn't do anything for me. That stuff's all going to be burnt up. Right. And he's saying, we're all going to, we're all going to stand there. We're all going to have to, you know, get received for what we've done. So don't worry about it. And again, we're not talking about sin here because the judgment seat of Christ isn't talking about sin either. You're saved. It's only believers that are going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't confuse this with the great white throne judgment because they're two different events. The great white throne judgment, the unbelievers are going to be standing before God and cast in the lake of fire. And they're judged according to their works because they didn't receive the atoning blood of Jesus Christ to save their souls. But the judgment seat of Christ is designed just for believers. And that is when the believers will be given rewards based on what they've done. It has nothing to do with our sins. Okay? And this passage so far, everything we've read has nothing to do with sin. It's talking about understanding, you know, eating and different days, observing days, but it has nothing to do with actually breaking God's commandments. It's all about maybe those who are weak, not understanding what's right and what's wrong, but... We're not to be getting into fights about this and striving about it with our believers and just say, you know what, that's fine. Um, obviously, you could help instruct somebody. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's different than disputing and fighting about it. Uh, you know, ha having just a conversation with someone and whatever. You know, there's, there's, it's, again, it goes, it goes to the heart and to the spirit in the way that you, you communicate with other people, especially other believers. Verse number um, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And this is really getting into more of the heart of what I want to preach on this morning um, in general. Because we've already seen who the weak person is and, and who the one who's correct, right? The one who's a little bit more solid in the faith and the doctrine and stuff like that. But now he's saying that even though you're right, you don't want to cause your weak brother to stumble and to fall and to have more problems in their faith as a result of you maybe putting something in their face. You know, you have a person who, who they, because they're kind of weak, they don't understand about the, the, the Bible, they're, they're real weak on this stuff and they're thinking that, you know, this is wrong. And you know that about this person. You don't just go and just, just you know, maybe, maybe they think eating meat's wrong. You don't just go right up in their face and be like, hey, man, this burger is great. Here, do you want a bite? You know, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. There's no reason to do that. All you're going to do is going to be provoking them, getting them angry, and putting a stumbling block in front of them. There's no purpose for that. You should, if you know that those things are right, then you should know, you know what, this person's a little bit weak in that area. And I'm going to support this person I'm not going to tell them that they're right, but I'm going to support them. I'm not going to do anything that's going to cause them to stumble. It's going to, it's going to cause them to fall. And maybe, and here's the other thing, and it explains this a little bit later in the chapter, is that you may get them to do something that they actually still think is a sin. So in that same example, let's say the person that's weak, they think it's a sin to eat meat. Because there's some people out there that believe that. Let's say this person thinks that, but they come into your church and everyone else is, you know, a certain way. 
and then you're like, and you know that they have a problem with this and you're just trying to get them. You know, it's not a big deal. Just go ahead and eat it. You know, it's a, everything's fine. But in their mind, they still think it's a sin, but they do it anyways, you know, out of pressure or out of whatever, whatever the reason is that they end up doing it. You have now caused that person to sin if they think that it's wrong. Because the Bible says that, that even if, um, you know, if it's not wrong, we're going to get to that. It's in this passage. Even though it's not wrong, if you think it's a sin, then it is a sin to do it. Because anything that is not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. So if you're, if you're believing something to be wrong and you do it, well, now you've just transgressed. And we don't want to, to cause our brothers and sisters in Christ to, to sin. We don't want to, to, to do that to them and put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Look at verse number 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. That's exactly saying what I was just saying. He said, I know that there's nothing that inherently it's just unclean. Now, in the Old Testament, there were a lot of animals, right? The, the shrimp and all these other, you know, all these various, the dietary restrictions during the time of the Mosaic law that God referred to these beasts are unclean, Right? All of that was done for a specific reason and a purpose and a teaching. And he's saying here, and, and all of that Mosaic law was lifted when the Levitical priesthood died, when that, when that was done, when, when the priesthood changed to Jesus Christ in the order of Melchizedek, those res certain restrictions and, and, and customs and, uh, and, and um, the service, you know, the, the, the sacrifices and, and carnal ordinances and divers washings, you know, these various things that the Bible says now have been lifted, they're done away with. The dietary restrictions were part of that. And he's saying, I know that there's nothing unclean of itself. You know, this animal isn't just inherently unclean, but to him that esteemeth anything, but if you think it is, if you think God doesn't want you eating this and it's a sin if you do, he says it is unclean to you. Verse number 15, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. And that's why I brought up charity at the beginning of the sermon, because this, this is what it has to do with your heart. He's saying, if your brother's grieved with your meat, it's something that you're doing, even though it's okay. He said, I know that there's nothing wrong with this. I know there's nothing unclean of itself, but I also know that he has a problem with this and he's kind of weak and he doesn't understand. I'm not going to just, you know, it's not charitable. It's not very caring, it's not very loving to just throw it in their face and to just be doing all this stuff in front of them. It says, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. He's saying, yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with eating meat. It's fine, <laughs> but don't let your good be evil spoken of because of, because of a weak brother or sister in Christ. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He's saying, what does meat and drink even matter anyways? That has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. What matters is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Being at peace with our brothers. Not causing extra disputations and fightings among other people who are a little bit weak. For he that, verse 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another, building someone else up. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And this is verse, verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If, you, if you're not sure about something, if you think something might be a sin and you do it anyways, you've just sinned against God. Keep that in mind. We always want to err. And this is just in general, whether you're weak in the faith or strong in the faith, if you're unsure about something, err on the side of caution 
and just don't do it? Because if you have this, if you're, if you're not sure, if you're not confident, if you don't have faith that, yes, this is right, it's no big deal, it's fine, you know, the Bible says this is okay to do, if you're not quite sure about it and you do it anyways, that's just as bad as sinning, uh, like of actually breaking something, if it, if it were. You know, if it turns out, say, oh, well, it wasn't a sin, any, you know, it wasn't against God's law anyways, but you did it not being sure, not, you know, just, you've already sinned. And that has to do with our heart. That has to do with our attitude. That has to do with how much do you care about God's word? Do you esteem God's word to be that important in your life? Or do you just think, well, I don't know, we'll figure it out. God, God's loving, he's forgiving, he's merciful, whatever. That's not, the good, that's not a good attitude to have. Let's keep going here. Verse 15, or I mean, excuse me, chapter 15. There's a lot, I could spend an entire sermon on chapter 14, but that's not the main focal point on, this, on uh, the subject matter. So uh, chapter 15, verse number one says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So he just got done preaching you know, this, this whole thing in chapter 14. And he's saying, look, we that are strong ought to, it's our job, it's our responsibility to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. If you consider yourself to be a strong Christian, if you consider yourself someone who's been in church for a while, you've got good doctrine, you feel like you, you're pretty established, right? You, you know pretty well what the Bible's saying, what we ought to do. You ought to be bearing the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves, okay? And this is where the rubber meets the road. You can be going to church for decades and be very, very knowledgeable about what the Word says and end up receiving nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Because you did nothing with your knowledge. Because you thought it was better to please yourself than to bear the infirmities of the weak, as one example. And let's face it, bearing the infirmities of the weak helping people out who are in need, it's going to be an inconvenience. It's not going to be what you necessarily want to do with your time. It's going to be something that might require some extra work. But if you are strong, you have the capabilities, you know the Bible, you, and there's someone that needs some help, you ought to help that person. And say, well, I don't want to because I want to go off and have some fun. I want to go to the lake today. I just want to sit down. I, well, I just want to sit down and relax. I just want to do these other things that just to please myself. It's not what you ought to do. Choices, you're, look, everyone's got their own choices to make in this life. But, and this is what I was saying. You know, this isn't a difficult concept to grasp. Someone's weak and they need help, you're supposed to help them. Okay, that's, a, that's the deep doctrine that we're talking about this morning. The hard part comes in is when you say, I'm not going to please myself because this person has a need and I'm going to help that person. And I know that they're weak. And I know that I'm strong and I'm going to help that person. And that's what's lacking in the majority of, of, of believers today. Verse number two, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. This is, a, this is such a common theme throughout the Bible of esteeming others better than yourself. Thinking about others. Stop thinking about yourself and your own gratification and your own just, just pleasure. Verse three, for even Christ pleased not himself. Now is is anyone going to argue with the fact that Jesus Christ came and was an example for us to follow? I mean, really? Like, the, <laughs> And do you know of anyone that was more selfless than Jesus Christ at all? And you think about everything that the Bible records of everything that... They, where do you see Jesus Christ saying, well, I go a fishing. I'm just going to... He's not talking about soul winning. Just going off into a boat and hanging out and relaxing and catching some rays and just doing some fishing, hanging out, 
relaxing. When does Jesus ever do that in the Bible? Ever one time. Not once. Was he worried about pleasing himself? No. You know why? Because he knew that he had a short time on this earth to get work done for the Lord. And we have a short time on this earth to get work done for the Lord. Hey, eternity is a long time. Our life here is a short time. Verse 3 there, Romans 15. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He went through that whole chapter, Romans chapter 14, talking about people who are weak in the faith and to accept that person, you know, and to not get in all these fights and judgments on them and, and, and causing all these problems, but rather, hey, bear the infirmities of the weak. Help them out. Please your neighbor. Don't please yourself. Edify and be like-minded one to another that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, that we could be unified in our faith, that we don't have just all these divisions within the church. This is the mindset we need to turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the mindset we need to have. It's the mindset that Christ had, and it's the true heart of a servant. Jesus Christ is coming back to rule and reign, but when he came the first time, that's not why he came. He came to be a servant. He came to minister unto you. He said, I didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister. He came so that he could minister and help other people out. That was his goal. That was his mission. That was his job, is to help other people out. And he left us with the example, and he left us with, with the way that we need to have the same mind that Christ had. And this is not the easy thing to do. Because you have to sacrifice in order to help somebody else out. You are giving up something of yourself to help someone else. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 9. The Bible reads, For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. This is the mindset that we all ought to have. This is the way that we should be thinking is that, hey, I'm happy when we're weak, but you're strong. I'm glad with making myself become weak, going through the hard stuff, doing whatever it takes so that I can strengthen you, build you up. And it says, and this also we wish even your perfection. I care so much about you doing well and you being strong and you doing better. I'm, I'll become weak. Fine. No problem. I'll sacrifice, I'll stay up late, I'll get up early, I'll work hard, I'll do whatever I need to do, but I want you to be strong. I want to help you be strengthened. I want to lift you up. This is the attitude. But all too often, the attitude has nothing to do with that among believers. Part of it has to do with, with our culture. We, we're taught to you know, look out for number one. I matter. If I have any extra time, then I'll help you out. But I got to do my stuff. I got to make sure that I'm taken care of. I got to make sure that, that, I have, that I have enough pleasure and I have everything else going on. And then maybe if I've got a little bit of extra time, maybe I'll do something for you. As opposed to, no, I'll be weak. I'll go through the hard stuff so that you can be made strong, so that you can be perfect. Turn if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just after the Bible goes over the, um, of course, the famous like rapture passages and to be comfort one another with these words that, that you know, those that are um, dead in Christ, those that are alive shall not prevent those that are dead and, you know, and goes through the, the various rapture passages. Just past those in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse number 14, the Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren, 
warn them that are unruly. So, in chapter, Romans 14, where we started reading, we're talking about judging people, right? And this is, this is what I was saying, is that they weren't sinning. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he says, look, warn those that are unruly. They don't want to be ruled. Or they don't want to hear God's law. They, to, they need a warning. But past that, it says, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. One of the things when you're dealing with someone who's not as strong in their faith, someone who's feeble-minded, right? Someone who's just not able to get things. And really, if you're feeble-minded, you're weak-minded. A lot of people have a hard time even getting some of the concepts in the Bible. They just, they just don't get it. They don't understand it because they're, they're not really founded in the faith or they're a little weak. It's important to have patience with people like that. You're not just getting irritated and aggravated and and blowing up at them and being short, you know, I don't understand why you're not getting this and, you know, whatever. If you love that brother or sister in Christ, you're going you're gonna to comfort them and support them and be patient with them and help them to grow, help them to see, you know, and realize that, you know, you didn't get to where you are overnight. If you're a stronger Christian, you didn't get there overnight. It took a while to get strengthened, to learn, to grow, to, to get certain sins out of your to do all the various things to get you to the point where you're at. And you got to realize when you're talking to someone else, hey, they need, they need time. They need to be dealt with patiently and, and help them to learn and to grow and not just, just be, you know, evil towards them, not be evil-minded towards them. Verse number 15 says, See that none render evil for evil in any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Turn if you go to Galatians chapter 6. Now, there's various ways to help people. Just as I mentioned before, there's, various, there's different weaknesses that people have. So some people um, are weak emotionally, physically, you know, spiritually, whatever. There are people have different weaknesses. Now, if you're weak in the same place that another person is weak, you're probably not going to be the best person to provide strength for that person. And this is actually one of the problems I see with the, the world's view on um, the, a lot of the, the drug addiction and the rehab programs and stuff. Because what they do is they try to get a lot of people who have the same weakness and the same problems to provide strength for each other. Now, I understand their train of thought. It's, well, these people understand and they could connect with someone else. But if they're still weak, I mean, you need someone, you're going to want someone to provide you strength that is strong. I don't want to rely on someone for strength that's just as weak or maybe even weaker than I am, right? Because then you're going to be, I mean, they're not going to provide you the strength that you need. You're going to be let down. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with talking to other people and connecting with people, but that shouldn't be your source of strength. Your source of strength should be coming from the person that doesn't have these problems, that doesn't have this weakness, and you can look at them for help on how not to be weak in that area. <clears throat> look at Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So this is someone overtaken in a fault. This is a sin. Remember I mentioned in Romans 14, it didn't talk about sins. It was just talking about a, a difference, you know, something that they just didn't understand properly. Now we're talking about someone who's overtaken. They're overtaken in a sin. They've got something going on in their life. And he's saying, you which are spiritual... You need to help restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. So when you approach the person, you're being meek. You're being humble. You're not just coming down at them, you know, all, all, all hard necessarily. Just saying like, um, you know, you want to direct them in the right path, but you want to help them, right? They're overtaken in a fault. They're in the snare of the devil and they need, they need some help out of that. And you're spiritual, you're strong, so you go to help them. But then it also says you need to consider yourself, lest thou also be tempted. So when you go to help someone else out, you still need to take heed to yourself. Because, you know, he that thinketh he standeth, 
Let, let him that um, think that he stands take heed lest he fall. We, need, we all need, we're all susceptible to sin. We're all susceptible to, um, to falling. And we need to consider ourselves, you know, because it's not going to do any good if you then get involved in the same exact sin that, that the person you're trying to help out is involved with. So um, you need to, to meekly, humbly approach them and, and help to restore them back and get, in, and get them away from their fault so that they're not overtaken anymore. Um, verse number two says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You're talking about bearing a burden. You know, someone's got work to, someone's got a, a hardship, a problem, a sin, whatever it is. You're supposed to help them and bear their burden. You're going to stop what you're doing and help that person bear their burden. It's a mindset. It's where your heart is and looking out for one another. This is what we need in, in, in every church. Every believer ought to have this mindset. Verse number three, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. Now, this is important to note that the... Um, we need to help others, right? That's the point I'm really trying to get across is to support the weak, to help those that, that need help while at the same time, though, bearing our own burdens. You want to try to be someone that's strong and that does not need the help of other people but is able also to provide help for others. So we all need help, we all need help at some point in our lives. Don't get me wrong. Okay, so... What the Bible's teaching, though, is that we ought to be able to take care of ourselves and not need that help, but then turn around and provide help for everyone else who, who needs it. Everybody at some point in their life needs help. I mean, that's, I believe that's just a fact. At some point, you're going to need something along the way. But the goal is to be able to take care of yourself and to be able to help others. That's where we want to be. When you're strong in the faith, you're taking care of yourself, you got everything under control, and you're able to then just be a source of strength for someone else and to help them out. Verse number nine there in Galatians chapter six says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't get bogged down with doing well, with helping people out. Don't get so weary and, and, and frazzled in your mind that you just want to quit and give up and stop helping people. Because what also happens is that sometimes when you have this attitude of helping those that are weak, they need help, they're not always appreciative of your help. That's a fact. The people who are weaker in the faith, they're not always going to have the right attitude. Right? So you're saying, I spent all this time and energy and effort helping this person, and they blew it off and they didn't care about it at all. So then it's easy to say, well, you know what? Forget it. I tried helping people out. They're not appreciative. So nuts to them. I'm just going to go and enjoy myself because why, why bother? Why sacrifice my own time to help these people out, right? Don't fall into that trap. Don't be weary and well-doing. Wait, what you're doing is good. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you're going to be able to say, look, I did my best to help these people out. What they end up doing with your help is their business. But it shouldn't stop you from helping those people. Don't get a bitter, rotten attitude where you don't want to help people out because of being burned in the past. It's still the right thing. You still should be supporting the weak. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. We're supposed to be doing good to people in general, and especially to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn if you to Acts chapter 20. We're almost done. Acts chapter 20. The Apostle Paul provides us a great example of, of the type of Christians that we, we need to strive to be. 
Verse number 32 of Acts chapter 20 reads, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. He's trying to get this through these people who saying, look, you know how I haven't been covetous. You know how I haven't been just concerned with my own pleasure and getting all these goods and seeking after the riches of this world. But rather what I did was that my own hands, I paid for my own way. No, I, you guys didn't have to take care of me. I worked. I worked for myself and I worked for those that were with me. He said, the necessities of myself and to them that were with me. He's like, I helped out me and I worked even harder to help out other people. And the reason why I did all this, I wanted to show you and be an example so that laboring, you ought to support the weak. It's work. But if you're strong, hey, use your strength and work even harder and help those people out that are weak. And you know what the goal of helping out someone who's weak and supporting the weak is to help make them strong. So don't, Last point, don't confuse supporting the weak with enabling the weak. We don't want people to continue to just be weak. What do I mean by that? For example, you know, if, you got, if someone is ensnared in a sin, maybe it be drugs or alcohol or something along those lines, right? And they're weak. They need help and they need strength. But you know what they don't need? They don't need you just helping to feed their addiction because, because they're drinking all their money away. Now they're broke. You say, oh, but I'm supposed to support the weak, so I'm going to give them some more money. You're not helping the problem. Do they need your support? Yes, absolutely. But just giving them some money that they're just going to go and turn around and spend on booze or whatever is not helping that person. You're enabling their weakness as opposed to helping them out. Do we love people? Yeah, I mean, we want to help them and, and do what we can to, to, to support them. Sure. But are we just going to enable them? No. I'll just read for the, uh, we got a couple more passages here. We need to be strong. We need to be an example. We need to remember that we're in a spiritual warfare. And also remember whose side you're on. Don't leave a brother or sister hanging to get persecuted for their faith and just leave them all by themselves either. You actually strengthen the wicked when you don't stand up with them. See, the, the, the actions and the way that you live your life determines who gets strengthened and who doesn't get strengthened. The way, you know, when, when you're vocal about your belief, when, you, when you're standing up there, when you've got, I mean, for example, in, in this, I'm not talking about myself, but just in general, let's say you have a person that's, you know, any pastor of any church or any person within the church who's standing on God's word and they come under a lot of fire, right? And they come under a lot of attack and they're getting ridiculed and maybe, you know, the media comes or whatever. And this happened to, to, uh, to me when I was a member of Faithful Word Baptist Church and Pastor Anderson was getting firestormed in the media, right? And at that time, there's a lot of people that might not want to be associated with that person. Might not want to have any, you know, I don't want people to see me with him. But he was standing on God's word. And that's, those are the times when you need to be standing there right there with them to support and to strengthen that person. Now, he's a strong individual. Thank God for that. But everybody needs strength. And, and where you do, what you do when you don't stand with someone who's taking a stand on God's word, when you just want to kind of slip into the background and not be noticed and not be seen and not let anyone know, hey, I actually agree with that. What you end up doing is you're not strengthening your brothers and sisters in Christ and you're strengthening the wicked people who are coming out against them. Because they, they, get, they, get, they are stronger and stronger and it's perceived to be stronger when no one else stands up. When they think it's just this one person who's a, a nut, right? 
But when you have a lot of people saying, no, actually, this is what I believe, that strengthens the whole cause. And it weakens the enemy's attacks. The Bible says in Isaiah 35, 3, you don't have to turn there. Isaiah 35, 3 says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Hebrews 12 says almost the same thing. Hebrews 12, 12 says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. This is something that comes up multiple times in Scripture, being able to support the weak and help those that, that, that aren't as strong and to edify people and to build them up and to strengthen them. But I think it's something that's lacking in general. This sermon could probably be preached and accepted in probably just about every Christian church in the world. Yeah, support the weak, right? Help people out that are in need. This isn't some, you know, uh, controversial sermon. This isn't something that's like, that, that I can't, you know, you're only going to hear that here, at least when it comes to doctrine. And this is something that everybody could probably say, yep, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. It's, it's easy to see that. The scripture is very clear about that. However, don't let this just be another sermon where you could clearly see what the Bible teaches, but you don't do anything about it. Think about someone right now that you know that's weak. Just someone in your extended life, someone that you know this person is weak and could probably use some strengthening. What are you going to do? Are you strong? Is this all just academic for you? Or are you willing to inconvenience yourself a little bit to help somebody else? We could all talk all day about how great God's word is. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we need to be helping them. We, you know, this is what we, you know, if you're righteous, you should be doing this stuff and telling other people what they need to be doing. But what are you doing? We see the life of Christ and as you read the New Testament. We're, we're, you know, if you're keeping up with our challenge, you've already read Matthew and Mark. So you've read through two accounts of the life of Jesus Christ. We see his selfless acts. We see him healing people constantly. We see him in prayer to God all night. We see him just out in the wilderness walking and, and traveling all over the place. Seeking, going to seek and to save that which is lost. Caring for other people. Visiting the poor, the fathers, you know, preaching the gospel to them, caring about these people, helping them in whatever way, capacity that he can with no thought to himself, having no home to go back to and even have the convenience of putting his head on a bed in his own house. Doesn't even have that. He doesn't have time for that. Don't let Jesus Christ's example be vain in your life. He left you with an example for a reason. Don't let it just be for nothing. Let's follow his example. Ask yourself, what can, what can I do? I know there's people that are weak and need to be strengthened. What can I do to help them? And do it. Spire eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we can receive from our brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord, just as much as that when we're down, when we're weak, when we have problems, dear Lord, we would love to have for someone else to help us and to strengthen us, God. As much as we would like that for ourselves, God, help us even more to go out and to support those that are weak right now, that do need help right now, dear God. Help us to, to not be bitter and, and to not... Um, be, be weary and well-doing and, and to just stop helping people because of maybe their lack of love or their lack of appreciation, dear Lord. Help us to do what's right regardless of what other people may think or do. Help us to walk the path that you have laid out for us 
regardless of the consequences that we're going to do what you've told us to do because we know that it's right and it's good. Lord, help us to be the good example that, that other people need to see of Christ in us. Lord, we all know in this room that, that what I preach today is right, that we need to be helping people. God, help us to convert that to action and to do that and to be a regular part of our life where we're concerned with other people more than ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.